gives us a holiday right at the start, a birthday party. The birth of Theotokos. It's not a biblical feast, but according to the Proto-Evangelion of James, she was born of Joachim and Anna, and this is a, certainly a, a teaching that we preserve. We mention their names at every service. We commemorate them uh, with the Lord every, every, at the end of every Vespers, the end of every Matins, every liturgy. And uh, of course, her birth is viewed as somewhat, well, if not quite miraculous, certainly special, because they were elderly. And like Abraham and Sarah at the very beginning of the scripture, and, uh, and like Elizabeth and Zechariah, who are also about to have a baby in the next generation, they're the elderly couple who weren't expected to have any children, so this is a special and blessed birth. But when you think of it, and I think that's the reason we have this, this holiday at the very beginning of the church year, every birth is special and blessed. In fact, every birth is miraculous. Any parents who have ever experienced the birth of a child understand this very well. We do the, the prayers for the mother on the 40th day. And we, we do this because she has become so holy, so special and blessed in the very act of giving birth that she needs to be welcomed back into the community. And although the prayers may indicate or may be understood as if she, she needs to be purified. It's not because she needs to be purified because she did something bad or that she's been soiled. It's just the opposite. It's because she's been so supercharged with holiness, she needs to be purified. You see, the priests, when handling the holy gifts, not only wash their hands, the bishop, as he gives communion, receives first and washes his hand first to be cleansed in order to even touch the holy gifts. But after giving communion to however many priests, he washes his hands again. Because he too has been, as it were, supercharged with holiness for handling such holy things. This is how we treat the mother when she returns from <coughs> giving birth to her child. So it's a beginning of the year to remind us of how wondrous and how sacred life itself is. We could have, each of us, never have been born at all. It's a problem I have even with those uh, who, who fight against, rightly so, the sin of abortion. Calling it a right to life. <clears throat> because there's no such right. None of us have the right to ever have been alive at all. It's always God's gift. It's always a miracle. It's always a wonder. In fact, that's a word that was used in one of the hymns tonight. Father Timothy pointed it out. He said, I really love this line, God of wonders and hope of the hopeless. Well, not to advertise it, but I recently wrote a book entitled Everyday Wonders. <laughs> and, and, and the book tells uh, it, simply my own experience over many years of priesthood of the things that happened that aren't big enough or spectacular enough to be called miracles, but are something more than coincidences. That's a wonder. At least that's how I, I use that term in my recent book. <coughs> the most amazing wonder I have to report to you began and unfolded over many decades. No one could have organized this, no one could have orchestrated it, no one could have planned it or even predicted this. I was in Paramus, New Jersey, Christ the Savior Parish. Father Stephen Vernax, father, uh, father's former parish, and his grandfather's former parish. Was, and Father John Nerbecki, may he rest in peace, the minor archpriest, uh, was the pastor then. And I had a little <coughs> class, sort of like this right now. That's what reminded me. And one of the uh, members in that class raised their hand and said, Father Michael, you've been in Alaska how many years? Tell us what Alaska is like. Now, that's a big question. If you want to know where the glaciers and rivers and mountains are, if you want a geography lesson, I can give you that, but that's not appropriate for a church school class. And if you want to know about the languages and the cultures and the tribes, that's great for anthropology, but again, not for the adult class before liturgy. So I don't know why it just occurred to me. I said, I'll tell you, Alaska's like this. We have women like this. In my wife's village, there was a matushka who was never idle. She was a Dorcas. She was a Tabitha. 
Besides raising six kids and having all the housework to do that that would entail, she was also constantly busy knitting and sewing. And she, she wasn't making these things for, for her own children. She gave them out to almost anyone who visited. Friends and neighbors all had scarves, mittens, socks, something that she made because she was never idle. She lived, a, I would say, a normal, for her generation, pious life. She got up in the morning, cold house, someone had to light the wood stove, but before she lit the stove, she lit the lampada and said her morning prayers. And she got this wood stove going so the kids could get warm enough to get out of bed finally and off to school. We didn't have plumbing in the village, so just getting water to the house required something of a chore, going to the well, packing the water home in buckets, using that for washing and cleaning and cooking. Uh, in any case, her husband was the postmaster. And consequently, um, they had a slightly higher income than most others in the village because he had a regular paycheck. And in that sense, I wouldn't say that they were rich by any standard, but they, they had a little more, a, a little nicer house. Uh, their children had a, a few nicer things, you know, little clothes on Pascha and that kind of thing. So uh, her husband then retired from being postmaster and was ordained to the priesthood after being the reader in the church for over 30 years. So she became a matushka when she should have been retired. And then in addition to everything else she was doing, she baked the prosra, she made father's vestments from her own, she had no patterns, but she had to just look at pictures and figure that out. She made all the altar and aneroid covers for the church in all the different colors. She was very busy, and she knew the church services by heart, in her own language, and you pick Eskimo. Sometime later, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Her, two of her daughters went to Kodiak on pilgrimage and prayed before the relics of St. Herman. When they returned uh, to the village, uh, to their home, they, they, saw her, they found her bed empty. They were afraid she had taken a turn for the worse because she had been bedridden for weeks. Then they turned around and there she was with buckets of water from the village well, completely restored to health for at least another year, maybe two. When she began to fail, for the last time, she instructed her family not to grieve for her. In fact, she ordered to be buried in her wedding gown. That may be a miracle in itself after 40 years of marriage. <laughs> um, and the day she died, the new village priest, a younger one who had come to replace her husband who had passed away, uh, he came with Holy Communion. She sat up in bed. She looked to the icon corner and made the sign of the cross. She crossed her arms, received the holy mysteries. She lay down and fell asleep in the Lord. A Christian ending to her life, painless, blameless, and peaceful. And the wind began to blow. It was November, and the, it was a warm southerly wind that melted all the snow and ice. People came to her funeral by boat instead of by snow machine or sled. After the funeral, as they carried her coffin out of the church, a flock of birds circled above them. We don't have birds in November. They're smart enough to leave in August. Where these birds came from, we still have no clue. The people who dug her grave say it was simple and easy. Usually at that time of year, the ground is, is hard as concrete and you have to chip away with, with axes and shovels, uh, digging only an inch at a time. But for her grave, it, the earth itself warmed. It was as if the ground opened to receive her. And they covered her singing Paschal hymns as is our custom, and the wind began to blow. And that night, the ground, the earth itself, froze again. And this was the passing of Matushka Olga. I wrote about, I said this in the, in the Paramus uh, class. That's what Alaska's like. And then, a few years later, when I was writing my second book, Orthodox Alaska, I wrote this up in two or three pages. Nothing spectacular, not, not very long, but two or three pages. And 20 years went by. We can forward the, the story 20 years. Uh, a woman wrote to me from upstate New York, saying that she had been tragically abused and suffered greatly in her childhood and teenage years. And she was seeing a counselor, a therapist about this, now decades later. 
And while she was undergoing this therapy, she had a dream or a vision. It's not quite clear if she was awake or asleep or somewhere in between. She said, as she, in, in the letter she wrote to me, I found myself in a birch forest. And a woman came from through the trees down the path, and I could tell somehow it was the Theotokos, the mother of God. But she didn't say anything. She walked right by me and signaled, follow the woman behind. And there was another smaller woman behind her who signaled, come with me. So she followed this woman to what looked like a hill, a hill perhaps the size of that wall. But it wasn't a hill. They went around the opposite side and there was a, a door, a kind of tunnel doorway. She called it the hill house. And inside there, was a, there were stone bowls with oil and wicks with flames burning. This, by the way, is the exact description of a traditional Yupik Eskimo house. Made of sod, stone bowls, lamps. And she even described accurately what the, what the uh, moss and the, and the plants smelled like, comparing them to various spices. And she was right on target. How this woman who's never been to Alaska from upstate New York knew any of this was already extraordinary. Then she said the woman gestured for me to lie down, and I lay down. And she treated me as if I was giving birth, except I wasn't pregnant. But all the pain and sorrow and darkness that had been physically part of my body left me. I felt whole and complete. Then the same woman helped me up, and we went outside. And by that time, it was dark, and the northern lights were dancing in the sky. And there was a fire with a kettle, and she served tea. Now we have a kind of tea called Labrador or Tundra tea, and she again described its fragrance perfectly. Then this woman finally spoke to the lady. She pointed to the sky where the northern lights were dancing and said, this is a sign from God of his ability to create great beauty where there had been only darkness and desolation. And then this woman began to walk away. And the lady having the vision called after her, who are you? And she said something indistinct, oh God. After this vision, she went to her therapist, who just happened to be an Orthodox Matushka. Is there a Saint Olga? Of course there's a Saint Olga. Can we find her icon? Surely. They found an icon of Saint Olga, Princess of Kiev. That's not the lady I met. Isn't there some other Saint Olga? And this woman, providentially, had just been reading my book and connected her vision with what I had written from Paramus, New Jersey, 20 years before. Maybe you met Matushka Olga. That's it. What's a Matushka? She had no idea. And so she wrote me a letter, writing all these things down, asking for a photograph of Matushka Olga. Except it was really bad timing. I was leaving for a year, sabbatical leave, in Moscow, Russia, the next day. And while I have photographs of Matushka Olga, they're buried among 20 or 30 albums. I simply didn't have time to respond to this request, so I left, I confess, for Russia without honoring it. She didn't give up. She wrote a letter to Matushka Olga's family. In fact, the envelope simply read, Family of Matushka Olga Michael, Kwithlok, Alaska, 99621. It turns out that her youngest son succeeded her husband as postmaster. So he got the letter. <laughs> but he didn't have time to open it or read it. He was busy sorting the mail. So as soon as one of his sisters came to collect hers, he said to her, I don't know what this is, Agnes. Take it home and you deal with it. He passed it on to his sister. She took the letter home, not knowing what it meant, what it was. And she read the same story that I just repeated for you. She said, I couldn't believe what I was reading. I sat down and read it again. I still couldn't believe it. I read it a third time. And then it was as if my whole house was filled with the fragrance of incense. This startled me, so I jumped up and ran over to my brother's house. That brother wasn't home, but his wife was. She said, to that wife. Many, make sure I, you can read this letter, but make sure my brother gets it when he comes home. So that sister-in-law read the letter and couldn't believe what she was reading. And the second time, and the third time, 
She also sensed the sweet aroma, the fragrance of incense in the house. This startled her just as her husband came home, without telling him what was going on. She said to him, I've got to get back to work. You've got to read this. <laughs> and off she went. Ivan also said years later, he told me, I read the letter also three times. But he didn't smell any incense. However, his next uh, errand was to visit a shut-in, a lady bedridden a few houses away. And as he walked into that house, the lady from her bed called out, What's that perfume you're wearing? Or are you seeing some other ladies now? <laughs> so we have this as the introduction. Now, people began to get suspicious. So I, I came a year, uh, some months later, and they showed me this letter. I said, oh yes, I got a letter just like that a year ago, and I never answered. They said, what should we do? I said, do you have a picture of your mother with several other women? Like a police lineup, you know. <laughs> Maybe she can make a positive identification. And so they sent a short note and a letter and the photograph, and this woman identified Matushka Olga Immediately, she said, that's the woman I saw, but she was younger when I met her. <laughs> There's something about those who are already in eternity, they somehow go back to their, their prime, their early, their younger years. In any case, the following Christmas, the story continues, um, while the choir was singing Christmas carols at that same house, the house of the sun, it, it, it wasn't a visible to start with, but after the choir left, one of the relatives was reviewing the photographs she had taken during the Christmas carol. And the whole wall behind the singers was glowing with a golden glow. And Matushka Olga's face clearly in the center of that glow. It's exactly what we read tonight in the second paramiya. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. That brightness that led uh, Ezekiel to fall on his face, it was that. Because there's nothing on that wall, it's a bare wall. No, no Christmas decorations or lighting. When his Beatitude Metropolitan Jonah visited the villages, that village a few uh, summers later, we had a memorial service for Matushka Olga at her grave, but it started to drizzle. It was a gray and overcast day. So we finished the Pandahita, the memorial service, inside the church. That time I had his camera, he said, take some pictures, and I did. But when we looked at the pictures afterwards, we didn't see it during the service, just like the Christmas caroling. In the pictures afterwards, the entire altar was filled with that same golden glow. On a, it wasn't a reflection from anything else because the weather was completely overcast and gray. But that same golden, now we, we can report to you dozens of more incidents literally dozens by now. And we've been collecting these and passing them on, uh, first to our bishop and through our bishop to the Holy Senate. Wondrous God of wonders. We might think that this only happened a long time ago in foreign lands. But we can report that no, these are the kind of things that God does. Not just long ago and far away, but among us. We often miss these everyday wonders. We, we don't even notice that it happened. We call it a coincidence or an accident. But you see, this feast of the Mother of God shows that, that God does things over very long periods of time with a deliberate plan. It took thousands of years to produce the Theotokos, a woman who was capable and worthy to give birth to Christ. It didn't happen overnight. God doesn't God doesn't tend to do things kind of suddenly or abruptly. The, the Bible is the story of how long it took for God to become man. Nevertheless, it happened. It took a few thousand years, but we have to remember, there is no past or future in God. For God, everything that exists, everything that ever existed, and everything that will exist is immediately present. In God, there is only the present tense, no past or future. So for us, it may seem like he's taking his time. <laughs> in, in his own experience, the Holy Fathers teach us there's no such thing. But this is his will, I believe. He wants us to have, we have so many saints already, that's a glorious thing. 
but no women. He wants us to have one who it will intercede because she has already given us his message. God is capable of creating great beauty where there had only been darkness and desolation, nothingness. The proof of that is he has created you and me also from nothing. We could have just as easily, as I said at the beginning, never have existed at all. So as we celebrate this first feast of the church year, let's give thanks to God for all the wonders in our life, all the miracles in our life, including our life itself, that we so often simply take for granted and begin the church year with joy and gratitude, giving thanks to God for his wondrous plan and the wonders he has worked, whether we've noticed them all or missed some of them, whether we've recognized them and given thanks, or whether they've escaped our attention, because ultimately, in fact, everything that exists is according to God's will and God's plan. I have to sl slide into one short little story to illustrate this, and I'll end, I promise. When my grandson, who's now 20, uh, went with me to an aquarium in Alaska. We only have one. It's not much of an aquarium. It's really a rehab center for injured animals. <laughs> but he took over. He took me by the hand, and we walked through it as if he were the docent and I were the student. And we practically ran through the displays from one, one aquarium to the, to the next, and he did so with great enthusiasm. Uh, he calls me Appa, the Aleut or Yupik name for Grandpa, so Appa, Appa, look, look, look. And he would literally jump for joy at the sight of whatever was in the tank. But we all, not, don't pause too long because the next tank was even more exciting and we had to hurry there. And we practically ran through the aquarium and we were done in 20 minutes. <laughs> then he took me by the hand because we ended where we started. We went up the same escalator and we did it again. <laughs> Slower. I would say at a kind of normal uh, speed. And it took about an hour to, to look at all the aquariums. And he did the same. He jumped for joy each time and exclaimed, trying to get my attention, look, 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 up, 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 up. At the end of the second go through, he took me by the hand and we went up the stairs for the third time. And with the same enthusiasm, but in slow motion, we went through the same display for the third time that day. I guarantee if we had any teenagers with us, they would be complaining about how boring this was. <laughs> but this was a two-year-old boy who was again jumping for joy the third time through. And I realized that for that little boy, it's as if God created all those fish that morning just for him. And the first time through, he was extraordinarily excited to see all those wonderful fish and the octopus in the tank and the, and the seabirds and everything else that was in there, uh, seals and, and sea lions and all the rest. The second time through, he was even more delighted and enthusiastic because, lo and behold, God did it again for the second time that day. And finally, the third time, he was even more delighted that God had done, and this is exactly what St. Gregory of Nyssa says, the creation is not a past event. It's not something that happened only billions of years ago. Because the world is sustained by God's love and God's will and God's power and God's grace. From this moment, and then this moment, and then again this moment, and then again this moment. The creation is happening uh, like an old celluloid movie, frame by frame by frame. <laughs> and so the miracle is a continuous one, <clears throat> and we fail to see it. So I believe that this feast is the beginning of the church year to help us begin with joy, with delight at the wonders of God, which include the very fact that I'm here, and so are you, by the grace and power and love of God.